Well, I'm excited to welcome on the podcast today, Kelly Flanagan. Kelly and I have known each other for quite a while. It's the first time we've really got to connect face to face in a while. He is a counselor. He's an author. We're going to talk about his latest book, The Unhiding of Elijah Campbell. And Kelly, welcome. It's good to see you. Dr. Kim, thanks for having me back. It's good to be face to face with you again. It is. It is. It is. You know, I think we missed a lot of that kind of stuff uh, over the last couple of years. And so it's good to get back back on doing some stuff. So let's kind of get into this this book, which I think is fascinating. You've written a lot of books, but this one is fiction, which is your first entry to that. So what led you to write a novel at this time in your career? Yeah, well, so I, um, it was, I guess it was the summer of 2020. So we were right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and uh, so my book, True Companions, uh, was slated to come out February of 2021, but it was part of a two book contract with my publisher. And, uh, and the contract said before that first one comes out, you have to pitch a second book. Um, so I'll never forget. I was sitting in the backyard talking to my agent one day and she said, so what you got to get this proposal in for your second book. Sure. You know, what do you, what are you thinking? And I said, well, I, I keep having this image of this bridge in, in, this bridge represents this moment in midlife where we can stay, keep retreading the ground we've been treading over and over again our whole lives, doing the same old things, chasing, chasing the same things. Or we could cross this bridge to new, more graceful ground uh, where our, our, um, our goals have shifted, the ways that we are approaching life, um, the ways that we're showing up to life have shifted. And so I keep picturing this sort of bridge and... You know, I've always had, I've always wanted to write a book about the the beatitudes, and so how the beatitudes can sort of mm -hmm. guide us, you know, from one set of values to another, um, one way of living to another. So I'm sort of imagining that, like, the beatitudes would be these ideas that cro help us cross this bridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're having this conversation. She says, "Well, what if the beatitudes were actual people that walked with you across the bridge?" And I said, well, that's really a cool idea, but that's, this is a nonfiction book, Kathy. <laughs> and so I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense. And she said, well, sit with it for a month and let's, let's see where that, where that goes. And so I sat with it for a month and I thought, you know, if, if, if I chose a loved one from my life, uh, living or past, and I, and I thought, picked a loved one for each of the Beatitudes that sort of exemplified one of those Beatitudes, maybe in the book, I could sort of have a dialogue with that that loved one of mine and and they could be the beatitude that sort of walks me in midlife from my same old ways of doing things into um to, to deeper more soulful and more beautiful ways of doing things and so I, I i pitched that to her and she said i like it let's let's turn it into a book proposal so we did i sent it off to university press and they came back to me and they said this is a great concept this midlife the bridge the beatitudes but we think it would work better as fiction um and I've been wanting to write fiction my whole life. So of course it scared me to death. <laughs> I did, I, <laughs> yeah. my, and, and so my first reaction was, uh, n no, I don't think you've got it. <laughs> Let me repropose it as a nonfiction book. So we rewrote it again. Um, I think the, I think the title of that second nonfiction proposal was like school of grace or something like that. Mm. And, um, and our eight graceful ghosts, maybe it was, I can't remember, but anyways, we pitched it again as a, a second time as a nonfiction book. And they came back again and said, this would work better as fiction. At which point Kathy again said to me, sit with that for a month and let's, let's see where this goes. And, um, and it, 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 it began in that moment when I really started to open up to the possibility of writing it and spending, mm -hmm. spending some time writing it. Um, it, it really like the, my passion for it started to emerge, it's been there my whole life, but it really started to emerge for the first time in adulthood. And um, I just started to have a whole lot of fun writing. That's awesome. That is so cool. Yeah. You know, and as I shared it before, that's something I want to do someday. So uh, it's exciting yeah. to see how that, and it's just interesting how God works in it. I mean, you, you go one way, you don't want to go that way. And then they say, mm -hmm. you got to go this way. And then God opens yeah, the door for it. Yeah. And if you, and, and for those who I won't spoil anything here, but as you as you read the book, there's this scene where Elijah um, has this imagined conversation with his grandmother who has passed. And, and you'll see in that scene, it's very clearly, in a sense, um, a conversation with this idea of blessed are the poor in spirit, where she mm. talks about how we, we move from valuing happiness to valuing joy 
but poorness of spirit is the bridge, which sort of helps us to, to, to value so something good. deeper than happiness. And then his second conversation with his grandfather is, um, is a conversation with the, some, with the, his grandfather representing blessed are those who mourn. Mm -hmm. Um, and the idea that, that grief helps us move from our attachment to security to a much deeper and abiding sense of resilience. And, um, and then at that point, um, the book started to run, the, the characters started to do their own things and I didn't quite stick to the beatitude structure, but it started out that way. It started out that way. Yeah. yeah if that, form. if that description doesn't get people to want to read the book, I don't know what, cause that, that sounds, it's just great. Uh, it's, it's such a good book. You. So one of the big themes is how we, uh, the past that we carry with us still affects us. Mm. How, how do you see that? And, and as a counselor, how do you see that? Yeah. Um, I, you know, as, as someone who, who counsels couples frequently, I, 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 I basically feel like if, if we aren't talking to some extent, how the past is for each spouse pushing its way into the present in some form or another, mm -hmm. then we're probably not getting to the depth of the truth of what's really going on here. Um, you know, one of the, one of the ideas that emerged as we started to think about how to share this book with people was uh, you, you can't let go of the past, but you can learn to dialogue with it. Mm. Um, in other words, so good. we so, we, we so badly want to put the hard stuff, the pain and the ways that it shaped us, we sort of want to put it behind us, um, pretend that it's not a part of us anymore, but we carry all of that past forward with us. And during important moments in relationships and with our spouses, it has a way of being triggered and pushing its way into the present. Of course, we blame it on our partners, not on our yes. past, okay. right? It's their exactly. fault. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, and, and so I feel like a lot of the work that I do with couples is, is helping them begin to notice the moment that your past is pushing its way into the present. Let's mm -hmm. slow down around that. Let's create some space for you to understand what's going on. What is the pain from your past that right now you're feeling the urge to protect? And, and how can we create a space where your partner bears witness to that? awareness and growth that you're going through so they can support you in it. And then of course, vice versa, it, you know, it's, it's always two way street. Um, but every once in a while we'll slow down on behalf of one spouse who's going, something's happening here. I'm tightening up, I'm protecting, I'm getting defensive. Yeah. I want to attack you. Okay. Let's, let's slow down and think about what's, what's the thing you're not wanting to feel right now. Let's make some space to feel it. Yeah. I, I think it's so good because I think so many times, and I think as a counselor, I see that sometimes people just really, I mean, they've, they've got the cancer in the relationship, but they really just want to put a bandaid on it. They want to do a little behavior, Monica. Actually, they want us to change their spouse and then everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what you're talking about is going in and, and getting the cancer out. It's digging and finding what's there and getting it out so that it really can be healthy in a way that it, I don't think it can with, I mean, obviously God works miracles, but that yes. work, I think God works within that. And I think that's when we're willing to do that, God does amazing mm -hmm. things yeah. in our lives. One of the ways, I mean, the way that I always start out in the couple's work these days is to say, um, like this, let's be honest, this is mostly each of you doing your own individual work in the presence of the other person, bearing witness to the other person's growth and healing. Mm. Um, and if the, if both of you are willing to take that on, amazing things are going to happen here. But if this, if this remains sort of a contest to see which one of you, Dr. Kelly thinks is more right or more wrong, like <laughs> this isn't going to go, this isn't going to go anywhere. And I just love the work when two people commit to that, that sort of healing and that growth. It's, it's very exciting to be a part of. It really is. And I, and I think what you said, I think sometimes it's, it's, it's scary to people. I mean, the mm -hmm. fear of the unknown of what's going to come up or all that kind of yeah. stuff. But, but man, it's just, I totally agree with you when both are willing to, because one can't really do it by themselves. They can work on themselves, but the marriage needs both of them working on, doesn't it? That's right. That's it right. really does. So if a listener senses their spouse is kind of carrying those things from the past that affect them. And I've, I've had that happen. I've had one spouse mm. come in and knowing the spouse's family of origin, they think, Hey, I think there's some stuff there. How can they help or encourage that spouse to deal with that? How do, what role did they play in that process? Mm. That's a great question. I mean, it's hard for me to talk about any of this without going back to, so I wrote a book called Lovable, which we talked about at one point. And yes. um, it's, it's hard for me to, to talk about any of this without talking about what I consider to be sort of the three fundamental realities of, of being human. The first is that 
we came into the world with a true self that God created for us that is worthy of love and belonging. Um, the second one is that at some point we all encountered a kind of pain we call shame, which was the message that we're not good enough the way we were created to receive love and belonging. And so what we do is we begin to build a false self um, mm. that, that is now in charge of going out and getting us the love and belonging that we believe we don't deserve. And this, this false self, this, what, what some people call the ego, it's this thing that we build to make sure that you can't hurt me anymore. Um, and to, to sort of like uh, uh, earn or prove my worth so that you will love me. And, and so when basically what we're talking about is that um, in, in the context of couples work, one partner's pain is starting to emerge, mm -hmm. right? And, and the, the, the challenge for the other, for their partner is to be able to hold space for that pain. Now, our, our defensive false self, our protective ego, it can't hold space for anything. It's designed only to protect us and get what we want, right? right? So we have to find a way to show up with our true self to that moment and hold space for the other person's pain to not try to fix it, to not try to rush them through it, to not try to um, understand it and get to the bottom of it, but simply to be there with it in an empathic way. And that's, that's growth in and of itself. Like we, I often say like, yeah, there's growth that's happening as you surface your pain and your past. Um, but the growth it requires to just simply bear witness to that and hold space for it and not go into all of your do it, fix it, yeah. you know, all those things. That's a lot of emotional growth happening right there for the part, for the person who's witnessing it. Um, and so that's a concept that we talk a lot about holding, holding space for our partner's pain. Yeah. I love that because I think our tendency is to fix them or in a lot of times our intentions are good. Sometimes we just, good intentions. Be, you know, that's really right. good intentions. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's so different and I think it's just hard for us sometimes just to let God work, let them work and just be there to yeah. encourage, to walk with them, to love them, Absolutely. do those kind of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think when we finally get there, I think there's a peace that comes with that because I can't, mm. you know, if it was Nancy and I, I can't fix her anyway. I mean, why in the world? I tried right. early in marriage. <laughs> I tried hard. How many, how many years, how many years did you try for? <laughs> oh, a lot. She could probably have a better, you know, and I, it was from my heart, you know, but I, but I realized, I mean, exactly. you know, there's somebody else that needs to help guide her through it in her in a relationship with God. And that was freeing mm -hmm. for me. It was kind of like, yes. Okay. God wants that more than I do. That's right. And, yeah. and it can happen and to back off it, but it, well, it was and, difficult. And I don't even trust my ulterior motives in wanting my wife to be healed, you know, cause they're so often they're, they're ego driven. They're selfish. I, I want her to approve of me and always be happy with me. And, feel yes. like I'm providing a good life for her. Right. And so it's right. like, I'm not really sure I trust all those motivations. So, um, but to be able to trust that God's God's love for us is pure and uh, wants that wholeness and that healing um, for, you know, for its own reasons rather than for anything selfishly that we bring to it. That's powerful. Yeah. I had a guy ask me one time, he said, well, well what, what do I do? And I said, pray. And he goes, no, really what I do. I said, pray. Yeah. And he goes, really? And I yeah. said, yeah, just pray. And I said, no, it's not just pray. Pray. And and because I think when we do that, that gives us wisdom of how, Absolutely. To, how to do the things we need to do to help them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like there's a powerful prayer simply, um, Father, teach me how to simply be there um, in mm. this, how to be in it, how to be in this feeling with my partner um, without getting defensive without trying to do anything to it. How can I just simply help me be in this feeling? And, um, and that that's a prayer God can answer. Absolutely. I think too, Kelly, as you were saying, I was just thinking, I think just our culture, we're so, we want things done so quickly. And I think just mm -hmm. to, to realize it's going to take some time on things and it's worth it to take that time mm -hmm. and not to get in a hurry or try to make our spouse feel, you know, you've been working on this six months now. It's uh, when we're going to wrap this up. No, it's not like that. 
Well, the accidental subtext that we, the, the message that we send in that, I mean, again, it comes from a good place. We want our people happy. We love them. But it also sends the message like, this is inconvenient. Can we get you fixed so that we can go back to having, you know, a happy, loving life? And um, like I always say to my kids, it's easy to love people who are happy. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's <absolutely>. harder, <laughs> it's harder to love people who are struggling. Like that's it's sort of like, you know, Jesus says, it's easy to love our friends harder it's true love is loving our enemies um because we're not getting anything out of it so to speak we're just doing it to be there for them so i think that is the challenge as our spouses are working through difficult things Mm -hmm. i I agree so are there any signs that we can look for to help us to see this in ourselves Mm. so um in the last this probably started for me in the two in the summer of 2019, it was before COVID. Um, I was at a, a couples retreat. I was co-facilitating a couples retreat, and my co-facilitator had the couples turn their chairs to face each other, and knees touching, looking each other in the eye. And she said, uh, "Okay, so on the count of three, I want you to do what I tell you to do. Don't ask any questions. One, two, three. Close your hearts to each other." Don't let the other person in. Keep yourself safe. Keep them out. Think about all the times that they've hurt you and disappointed you. Do not let them in. And she sort of coached them through this. And then she said, one, two, three, open your hearts to each other. Let them in. Think about why you got to be with them in the first place. Think about the amazing things that exist in your life because of them. Think about the things you're grateful for. Just let let them in. One, two, three close your hearts to each other. (laughs) And she did this back and forth uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes, right? And then she brought us, brought them all together. And she said, um, tell me what that was like. And they all said the same thing. Well, when my heart was closed, my body tensed up, my chest was tight, you know, my gut clenched, my my jaw was clenched. And when I opened my heart to my partner, like I felt a warm sensation of relaxation go through my body and I felt um, peaceful and I felt grateful. Mm. And, and she said, well, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm glad that you now know what that feels like. But the reason I really wanted you to do that exercise is I wanted you to know that you have a choice, um, that you in every moment have a choice to close your heart to your partner or to open your heart to your partner. And the, and the reality made me think of that Viktor Frankl quote, um, between every stimulus and response is a space. And in that space is our power to choose and our freedom. Um we tell ourselves that if my partner does X, Y, and Z, my heart is going to automatically close to them. And if they do ABC, my heart mm-hmm. will open. But in reality, there's a little bit of choice happening, a moment of choice, which if we can wedge it apart and, and come to awareness that I'm making a choice in this moment, we now have an opportunity to, to, to keep our, our hearts open to our partners. Um, and, and in my work with couples, what I've been doing it, since 2019 is recognizing that that feeling that everyone described when my heart closed, I felt this like clenching in my chest. That's the earliest warning sign sign that our heart is closing. Mm -hmm. That we're we're going into defense mode that our our protective ego is kicking in. And, uh, and so I do a lot of um, mindfulness and awareness work around what are you feeling in your body with couples? When's that first sign that you feel your heart closing in your body? And it's always somewhere between the gut and the temples. That mm-hmm. can, I've never heard, I've never heard of uh, anyone say, yeah, I, my heart was closing to my partner and my toes cramped up. Like it's just <laughs> never been said. No. Right. Right. It, it's like a roiling in my gut. It's like doors slamming in my chest or like this pressure in my chest, or it's like a, a full, um, heady sort of clenching feeling in my head. And so what we do is we try to attend to that. And as soon as we notice it, go, okay, there's your moment. You can feel your heart starting to close. What can we do to get you back open in yeah. this moment to your partner? Because once that heart's closed, right? Once it's clamped shut and you're in defense mode, no conversation is going to be productive at that point. So Absolutely. we've got to do the work to get you back open so we can actually start to engage and communicate again. So a lot of it's just around that moment and mm-hmm. uh, cultivating an open heartedness in that moment. And helping people realize that you do get a warning sign. Your body is going to react in in some way there right and i agree with you when you said that no i've never heard anything that didn't cover this part of our body (laughs) for some reason and i think it it just i mean god gave us so many things to help us but a lot of times we ignore that and so like you said once we get go so far then it's tough coming back after that it's that you know it's that 
Um, it's the blessing of our faith tradition is that uh, God came to be in human form. Um, we tend to want to like toss the body out as sort of a problem because um, it can be. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. But there's also something apparently sacred about being in human skin. And um, and so to, to trust that our bodies are actually uh, instruments we can work with, instruments of awareness, um, I think particularly in this regard, they just give us great early warning signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one of the things of, and I know a lot of people, it, it's a struggle to, to get them to want to dig into the past. And and yet I think mm -hmm. there's, there's because it helps us understand where we are today, I think, and the, and how, what we can change now. And I tell people, it's not to give your parents a hard time or to, anything that went on in the past. It's to understand that and move right. forward. So if somebody's listening today and they've been thinking about mm -hmm. that, what are some practical ways that they can begin to deal with their mm -hmm. past? I really appreciate what you just said. I, I think one of the first, you know, one of the first ways I feel clients close their hearts to me when we, I suggest we look at the past is, um, you know, I don't, my parents were good people. I don't want to like be harping on my parents uh, or on the other side of it, there's not going to be any reconciliation with my parents. I've tried that conversation doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And, and my, my response to that is this is not about um, dealing with your relationship with your parents this is about learning how to be a parent to the younger part of you that is wounded and scared and hurt in there and asking for protection. When that heart closes, when we feel that clamping shut in our chest, it's actually a younger version of us. Uh, it's our true self, our younger self saying, hey, don't want to go through this again. Protect me. Right. Yeah. Um, I actually I had a pastor who reached out to me right after I, I published Lovable. And he, he I'll never forget this. He said, I read Lovable. Um, and this idea that our youngest self is our truest self, right? Um, and he said, uh, I was, I got up to preach a, a while back on a Sunday morning. I looked out into the congregation and the district superintendent was sitting out in the congregation and he had not told me that he was coming. And, uh, and he said, um, and I immediately started to panic because I knew that meant evaluation and, and that sort of thing. He said, but then I, I asked myself, I'm sitting there in the pulpit and I asked myself, like, why am I panicking like i i know how to give a sermon like i'm pretty good at it he said and i realized it was the little the little boy in me that was panicking mm -hmm. he's he doesn't like to get up in front of people adults talking to adults and and doesn't like to be evaluated and he said right there i had a conversation with that younger version of me and i said hey dude i got this um i've, I've preached a lot of sermons i'm actually really good at it but you are the most playful the most spontaneous, the funniest parts of me, would you get up there and, and preach this sermon with me? And he said, I, we got up there and preached the sermon together and, and it was a huge hit. Um, I love and, that. Uh, isn't that a great story? And so, oh, yeah. yeah, what are we up to when our past is, is surfacing within us? It's, it's, an, it's a younger version of ourselves that's been hurt and is not wanting to be hurt again. And, and so this isn't about like, camping out in in a conversation about the people who hurt us a lot of times we don't even know who that was can't right. remember it right it's about actually being able to create space and dialogue with that hurt part of us so that it feels seen and heard and recognized and safe again at least with us um and uh, and this is man this is stuff that i i was a trained empiricist a phd level psychologist and i like inner child like it mm -hmm. was never a comfortable, a comfortable space for me until I, I, uh, I started writing these letters to my daughter and publishing them online and they were going viral and I couldn't believe it. All these adults, men and women of all ages were emailing me saying, thank you. For, they weren't saying like, Hey, thanks for this letter. I'm going to give it to my daughter. They were saying, I needed to hear these words. Wow. Still. I needed to be reminded that I'm lovable, that I matter, that I belong, that I'm not alone. And, uh, and it's just started to surrender to the truth. Like we've all got a little kid inside of us still waiting on a love letter. And that, that version of us is hurt. And it's just wanting to know that it can be safe to come out and play a little bit. Yeah. Because I think it, it, when we're young and those things happen, I think it is, we figure out how to survive at that time. And we That's make, right. and most of the time, I think it's really not a conscious decision. It's just the way we figure out works for us. So we don't get hurt anymore. And, and, mm, and, right. and sometimes we might make a conscious decision, but I, I, a lot of people I talk to, they, they, as they think back about that, it's like, 
it wasn't a just, okay, I'm going to do this, this, and this. It was more like, I'm not going to get hurt anymore. And so as That's things right. happen, you begin to do that. And then you, you right. just carry that on. That's right. I, I think it's happened to all of us. Um, I think there's about zero people in history who at age seven, eight, nine, were conscious of, of just start, you know, starting to protect themselves. But um, the first instinct at that age is to at first start to tuck yourself away go into hiding, don't let people see what yeah. you're really thinking and feeling and, and doing. Um, and then later we start to add more aggressive layers of, of protection, you know, the, the mean girls in middle school and all the terrible aggressive things middle school boys can do and, and all of that. And then at some point we sort of, we develop this sort of elevated version of protection, which says, oh, look what I've accomplished and achieved and look what I've got. And you don't have a right to question me anymore, but underneath all those layers, Right. It was a little kid who unconsciously at some point said, this doesn't feel good. I need, I need yeah. to be separated from, from life. I need to be protected in here. And we're just trying to welcome that kid back out to, to get to experience life again. Absolutely. And bring him into our marriages. Right. Or her right. into our marriages. Yeah. Well, and you know, exactly like, um, you know, when I hear a partner, <laughs> I hear it all the time. Well, I just don't think I can be patient. Like my wife is sad. It's, and I just don't think I can be patient with it. Well, would you be patient with your daughter, your seven-year-old daughter? If she came to you and said, I'm sad, so-and-so picked on me at school. And well, of course I would. Okay. Well, there's a little girl inside your wife who just wants a safe space to feel sad about the things that broke bad today. And, um, and so you do have the capacity. You just have not chosen to exercise that capacity with your, your spouse. And, and you can do that. We'll learn how to do that. That's so good. Absolutely. I, I remember one time and it, this was a lady trying to, and just wasn't letting herself free herself from that. And, and so I, and right. the things that happened to her, she was seven. And I said, when you go to church Sunday, you go to the seven year old little girl class and just, just stand there and look in and watch them for a while and put yourself in that mm, place and then so rethink what happened to you. And, and mm. you're dealing with it as you would as an adult. Go back and deal with it as a seven-year-old mm. girl. It made such an impact on it. And I love what you said about that. Sure, you do that for your child. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. But, oh, man. I, my, I have a 19-year-old son who um, just left home, has been telling us since eighth grade he doesn't want to go to college. He wants to move to Chicago and become a, a comedian. Uh, <laughs> and so he is now living in the city on his own, paying his own way taking classes at second city in Chicago. And, yeah. uh, and I look at that and I'm, first I'm in awe of his bravery. And second, I was like, was I, was I that young when I was 19? <laughs> oh yeah, I was <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. Oh yeah. Imagine how young I was at seven or eight, but we just, yep. we, we just don't give ourselves credit for that. No, no, I, absolutely. Well, that's cool that he's doing that. What a cool deal. Follow your dream and give it a chance give it a chance. Yeah. yeah. And it's, he's like, dad, it's, I'm always nervous. It's scary. And I was like, yeah, I think that's how success feels about 80% of the time is nervous and scary. <laughs> like you're doing, you're I, doing good things, man. I bet I was actually this a little bit, but I was reading a deal on Steve Harvey yesterday because I was using a quote for him and hmm. something and, and go back and see all the jobs he did before he got famous and how he was homeless for three mm -hmm. years and how he lived in his car for a long time. And, you know, right. I think sometimes we look at some people that have been successful in different roles and we think they just got, they just happened, you know, there they are. But no, there's, right. we all pay dues to get where, where we are. And so right. the fact that he's willing to get out there, uh, I don't think I would do that. I think that would scare <laughs> me to death. I know, <laughs> me too. I couldn't do it. I said, to him, are you willing to pay the dues? He's like, dad, look at my bedroom. I can live in Phil. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> what a great answer. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> oh, so let's talk about some unconscious competition between spouses competing rather than mm. connecting. You mentioned it just a little bit earlier. So what are uh, the ways that we compete with each other? Because I think it's what's well, so common. Mm, it sure is. You know, I go back again to you've got your true self and then you've got your, 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 your false self, your ego. The ego only knows competition. It doesn't, it doesn't know connection. It's, it's designed, you know, the, particularly in those middle school years, you start to think, well, the people who win are the people who get respect. The people who win are the people who get loved. They seem to be the popular ones. So let's, let's start to compete at everything and try to win. And, and so we bring that into our marriages and, as you know, it, um, 
it just sort of eats away at the at the relationship. What are, what are what are couples competing at? Um, the the funny thing, I, funny um, in hindsight, um, I I compete for I compete with my wife for who's loving who best, right? Mm. And but the the funny part of it and the problem is the, the blind spot is I compete with her by trying to outdo her at my love language, which is acts of service, which she doesn't care about at all. Like she just walked in the other night and I had spent like an hour, like just getting the place immaculate. Like I wanted her to walk in and just be wowed by like, wow, I didn't expect this. She walks it, doesn't notice it. doesn't <laughs> notice it at all. Right. Um, and yeah. so we sort of compete by heaping our love language on another person, which is oftentimes just missing, missing the boat altogether. Sure. Um, and, uh, and rather than trying to sort of, again, put, put our competition aside and go, what's it going to take for me to, to connect with you in your language in the way that you love to be loved. Um, and which isn't going to be as rewarding for me. It's not the language no. I speak. It's just not going to be as rewarding. Um, and so, but I'm going to do that for you because that's the way that you receive, receive love. And, and it tends to be when we get in that sort of spiritual space of I'm going to give you love in the form that you appreciate it, even though it doesn't feel great for me, you're totally out of competition mode at that point. Yeah. Um, to, to get there, you have to leave competition behind. You have to be valuing connection and closeness more than competition. So, mm -hmm. um, so what's your spouse's love language? How can you, how can you make sacrifices to, to heap that upon them? Even though for you, it's probably boring, unrewarding, seems senseless, um, but you do it anyways. Yeah. That's, that's so good. And I think that's what Jesus shows us. Don't you? I mean, he, everyone he met, he met them where they are, um, and loved them right. in the way that they needed to be loved. It's, uh, uh, right. it's just hard for us sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know if you ever, I don't know that I've ever counseled a couple that they had the same love language. I've never, I mean, no, maybe they don't, maybe they don't exist or they don't need counseling. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, that could be true too. But I uh -huh. think that again, I think it's our differences that God gives us. And when we learn to embrace them and, and, and let them and go with that, what a difference it makes. Yeah. You know, Nancy's well, quality time. I mean, time. I think that, yeah. Nancy's is quality time. Quality time. And and I didn't, my mom's was gifts. Yeah. And so, well, the first year of marriage, mm -hmm. Nancy got so many gifts. And I thought, mm -hmm. this is not affecting her the way it did my mom. And so right. finally, when we were figured out it, she needed just my time and she was able to verbalize that to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's, Actually, I thought that's stupid. Why do you need that? <laughs> that's the first time. My mom didn't need that, you know. Yeah. But then I began yeah, yeah. as I would do that, and I'd see what it did for her. Because it, you're right, it didn't do a lot for me. I had to learn the joy of doing it for her and seeing that in her. And that's and honestly, that's not easy sometimes. It's not, and and my wife's is, is quality time as well, and. And I, I can honestly say, and it's, it's such a humbling thing to admit that we've been married now 21 years. Wow. I think this year for the first time, I, I finally understand what she means by quality time. Because my definition of quality time is going to be different than someone whose love language it is, right? And, yes. And I remember I said to her, it was late this year, I said, I think all you really want for, for me is just the fullness of my attention for a little while, the fullness of my attention. And she's like, yeah, that's what I've been saying for 21 <laughs> years. <laughs> Cause I think quality time is like, let's go out to a restaurant and do this and this. But if I'm not fully present there, if I am not giving her the fullness of my attention um, for her, that doesn't count as quality time. And so I'm, yeah, we're still learning what our spouse's love language is. And, and I, I agree. And I think, it, I think with Nancy's, it has kind of refined a little bit over the year. Um, mm -hmm. And so I have to, mm -hmm. have to keep pursuing that, you know, it, you know, I, love that. I think the first thing I did was just, well, I've said, I had her sit on the couch with me while we watched the football game thinking that was going <laughs> to be true. all the time. Nope. It, it wasn't. No. It was for me. <laughs> it yes, my deal completely. Right. So, uh, that's yeah, right. I, I think it is. And I think it's one of the things that I've learned after we just celebrated our 53rd anniversary. And so oh, congratulations. I, and what you said, it, it, I, yeah, you still learn things. And I, I think ever, if you ever think you've got it in marriage, I think you're cheating yourself because I think every we the way we change God, what, what God teaches us, we have so much to continue to learn about each other mm -hmm. all the way through. And it kind of becomes an adventure after a while. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. Know. Well, and I, in the midst of learning that about my wife this year, um, we, we, I can honestly say this was our, the toughest year of our marriage. Um, and, and in hindsight, I think what happened was um, there for most of our, as I'm learning that what she wants is the fullness of my attention. Um, I'm trying to give it to her, but she was going through a year where she's launching her, her, her oldest, her firstborn, yeah. um, feeling, feeling the, the passage of time more than ever and how quickly our next two are going to be flown from the nest. And what I was not hearing is the way you give me the fullness of your attention this year is by pouring into time here at home with these kids. It's not us going out on a date. It's sitting down for a board game with these two who are still at home and making the most of the, the time we've got left. And, and so her, what, what quality time meant for her changed dramatically this year because of the launching of our oldest. And, uh, and so we have, yeah, I really appreciate that. You bring it. That's such a great example just, uh, yeah. of how that, how it does change same, same love language, but, mm -hmm. it, but yep. yeah. Um, but, That's but it right. changes some and how, how it plays out. That's really good. What about do, um, the boundaries play a part in any way, personal boundary between spouses, uh, placing on ourselves to get out of this comparison thing. Hmm. I think. I, when I think about how to exit the comparison game, um, I think the thing that stands out the most is that when we are when we're in the comparison game, essentially we are in a we're we're in a, a place where we say you're the problem. If you would do more, be more, give more, and so on, as much as me, for instance. Mm -hmm then then we would be okay we see the problem of the marriage rooted in our partner um and and so to me um what we there's this there's this concept in the um in the marriage literature called empathic joining around the problem i'll say mm -hmm. it again empathic joining around the problem the idea is that um if we can begin to visualize together that the problem is not you problem is not me the problem is this third entity that mm -hmm. we are called to sort of collaborate with and, and deal with together then i think now all of a sudden we're not in competition with each other we're going yeah it's hard it's hard to give more because we've got three kids who are each in two sports and so how are we going to work together empathically understanding how this is hard for you um, encouraging you to create boundaries for yourself if you need them and me to create boundaries for myself if i need them to take care of myself how can we encourage that mutual boundary setting, but understanding that we're doing it not as a boundary against each other, but boundaries for our own health as we face the stresses so and good. the rigors of life. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. It makes a lot yeah, of sense. Empathic joining around the problem. It's a, it's like a litmus that. test I use for myself. Like, am I currently thinking about how my wife and I can collaborate to together to overcome this, this very stressful difficult journey that we call being human or am i thinking that she's the problem in my life would be great if she would just get it together and, and <laughs> yeah. if it's not empathic joining around the problem i'm probably in the wrong space yeah no that that's so good and i think when we get in that space of if they would just change i mean we just we just get stagnant and we don't grow that's and right. are married certainly nothing happens with it probably goes backwards in that and that's and right so it's it just uh it's it's just making that decision to um to quit quit fighting each other for that. It's not a competition. That's, that's right. I mean, yeah, we're we're basically offloading all of the responsibility for change to the other person. And yeah. Saying I, I get to tap I get to tap this one out here. I'm I'm you know, I don't have any changing to do right now. And, right. Call uh, me when you get better. Responsibility. Yeah, yeah, call me when you get better. Exactly. exactly. Let's talk about um uh, an idea that was in the book, The Unhiding of Elijah Campbell. Elijah says to his wife, Everyone else in my life had always interested in me. She rounded me up. How can a spouse adopt a rounding up attitude, even though inevitably mm. our, spouse, our spouse is going to let us down at times? Mm, that's a great question. That's a great question. I often say that the turning point in a marriage, when two people are really working on a marriage and growing, the turning point is when your, your image of them your belief in them, 
your trust in who they are and the goodness of their heart and their desire to do their best and show up the best, when that image of them becomes more real than all of the ups and downs of life and uh, conflict, you know, stress. Last night, um, it was it was bedtime. It had been it was MLK Day, you know, and so the kids had had the day off, and my wife took a glance at screen times for the day and was like, "Oh my gosh." Our kids were on screens all day while we worked. <laughs> we're ter- we're terrible parents, and we need to do something about this immediately. Yes. And I was not at my best. I was exhausted as well, and 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 dismissive of that. To which she reacted. But there's something different that does happen for us now, which is, um, I, I, I know, I know that we don't have a whole lot to fix in that moment. If that, if that makes mm. any sense, um, because. We have a basic trust in the other person that once we get a good night's sleep and we're well rested, if there's an issue to deal with, we'll work on it together. We're on the same team. Um, and so I, I I see her snapping at me and I can go, I know that's not how she wants to be. Yeah. I know that she does not want to be snapping at me right now. I know she's tired. I know um, I know tomorrow this will be different. And And if you can know that, if you can sort of reside in that faith in each other, then it is remarkable how much conflict you uh, unhealthy conflict that you avoid that you don't have to repair mm-hmm. or reconcile. You can just get right back to, to collaborating together to, to handle life. So it's really just giving some grace to our spouse, accepting them right. as they are and knowing that I'm going to need the same thing from her Man, it's, right? it's, at some point, you know, and, Absolutely. and I, we get there a lot better than we used to. Mm-hmm. That's but right. there's still challenging times, and I think people need to know that. You know that it, it's. Uh, but when you, I just know from being married as long as we have, when we embrace that, and I'm able to say, "Yeah, she's going to be great mm-hmm. tomorrow. Just love her right now." Mm-hmm. And how good it is. And when I don't, because usually when those things, when one of us has that kind of a mood, it didn't go well mm-hmm. when the other barks back at her. Right. Yeah, you know, we're ready for right. a fight. You know, and so That's right. I. I think, yep. um, and I think maybe it's just our pride or whatever gets in the way, but, but I know what a difference it makes when we give mm-hmm. each other grace and just say, I Absolutely. love this person. You know, I kind of think we, yes. maybe we thought that when we got married that, you know, I love this person enough to, you know, take a warts and all, no matter what. And then we kind of, well, we lost that for a while, but I think we've got to get back that we do. And I, I, I hear this little voice in the back of my head right now, kind of wanting to make sure that like, um, what listeners aren't hearing is you could just avoid all conflict by giving your partner a pass. That's not what we're no. saying. Um, Good point. We're saying that w- when you reconvene the hard conversation, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be different because you've, you've held, you've held a graceful image of your partner that they're always doing the best that they can. And, uh, and, and they're giving their best and, and, and you can trust that that's going to be the case going forward. Then you're more equipped to deal with the hard conversations. Absolutely. Cause you may say, you know, yeah, I'm also say that this is really in the time to do this, to talk about it. And so right. you accept them there and you say, hey, the next day, maybe you sit down and say, hey, let's talk about what happened last night. And it will go so much better. That's right. Yes, that's right. So much better. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tried to... Um... I tried to solve every problem, get rid of my anger before the sun went down on it. It never, it never went no, very well. No. It always seemed to just make things worse. No. You know? I know. And it, yeah, I don't know why we all kind of, I think we all go through that sometime. And, you know, I, you know, and I had couples that would tell me, you know, we weren't going to go to bed till the fight was resolved. And it said, we're exhausted. It's up to three in the morning and then finally we'd just fall asleep fighting. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Cause the more tired you get, the less well it goes. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> it just, just doesn't get better yeah. at, at all. Yeah. So one final question, what are you enjoying about your marriage today? You talked about it being, I, you, I just flashed back mm-hmm. to when our son left and just, yeah, the things mm-hmm. that, and I think it affects a mom different than a dad. I think it affects both of us, mm-hmm. but just in different ways. And, um, uh, and so those, I think those were, those were challenging times mm-hmm. that we had to walk through together. But what are you enjoying about your marriage today? Um, I do feel like having come through last year, um, I, think, I think there's a sense of if we can get through a year like that um, and feel stronger, we can, 
we can trust that any hard time is going to make us stronger. So I think there's, I think there's that quiet confidence about us now that we wouldn't mm. have had before the hard time. Um, you know, but the, the specific thing that comes to mind is, uh, we sat down with our two, two remaining kids at home, 15 and 13, and we sort of set our, our vision for a family uh, for the year. What are we, what are we focused on? What are the fun things we want to do? What are the ways we mm-hmm. want to serve? What's our, what's our mission for the year? And the mission we came up with is we want to dedicate ourselves to holding space for each other, no matter what the other is bringing to us. Oh, so, that's wild. um, so good. yeah. And, and, and we're trying, my wife and I are trying to lead the way on it and I can feel it. I can feel it when, when I'm not at my best and she's just holding space for that and, mm. and, and, and not reacting, but also not leaving. That's what holding space is, right? Yeah. Um, I, I I spent an awful lot of time last year fooling myself into thinking I was being emo- relationally mature because when she'd become reactive, I'd go, okay, I'm just going to let this go and I'm going to walk away. Um, and then I heard this great quote by Richard Rohr, the opposite of control is not letting go, it's participation. Mm. Um and, and I realized that what I was, I was bypassing the hard work of participation by going, okay, I'm going to let go and just go write a blog post that everyone will love. And <laughs> right. Things. And they'll tell me how great um, I am. <laughs> so she's yeah, not tell me how great I, I am. Yeah, yeah. I'll go, I'll go create that sense of control and admiration over here. And so holding space is continuing to participate in what the person is going mm, through. I love that. Um, not reacting to it, but being there with it for it and in it. So we're trying to do that as a family and I can just, um, I can honestly say, and I might get a little a little emotional. Um, it's the it's the it's the most powerful way to feel loved mm. that that I could describe in our marriage is to have me feeling something big, strong, um, and have her hold space for that, and for me to be able to do the same for her. Um, and ironically, the more we do that, the less it seems there is to hold space for. Um, there's there's yeah. less need to do that because there's more ease and peace and joy in the relationship. More connection, yeah. More connection. That's right. That's that's so good. That's great. This has been so much fun. I love getting with you. I love what you do (laughs) from lovable to true companions to the new one, then the unhiding of Elijah Elijah Campbell. Uh, They're all great. Um, And if people want to connect with you, where are some other places besides going through the books? Yeah. Um, so my website is drkellyflanagan.com, drkellyflanagan.com. And, uh, and if you go there and sign up for my newsletter, you'll get about a, you get like a, about a monthly email from me and, uh, and, and some, some extra goodies. You get the lovable mini course, um, which is a five session little mini course on, on how to put some of those ideas into practice. Um, and then, uh, on, you know, the new novel, um, is, I think it's a, it's a great way to settle into a lot of the things we've talked about today not with our head, but with our hearts. I hear people say, I read it the first time and felt something change in me. And I go back and read it the second time to figure out what. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, so unhidingbook.com is the, is the place to go to to find out more about that. Yeah, and I think we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I think there is something different when we read a, um, a novel because we're, we are more relaxed. And I think if I'm reading a, a book of, oh, this can make my marriage better, well, I'm going to focus because I don't want to miss anything. And I think when you're, when you're reading a novel, those, those principles that you have in there and those things that those yeah. uh, just kind of, kind of sink into us. And, and I can see That's that makes right. sense of how, Hey, there was something there. I got something, but there's something else. I'm gonna read this thing again. Yeah. Well, and you're ironic. I never thought about it like this, but in light of our conversation, like when you're, when you read a story or a novel, you're holding space for the main character. Like you're Absolutely. not, you have no control yeah. over them. You're not doing anything to them. You're just going through it with them. And so it just opens up that space and us, that capacity to do that. And, that's uh, a great that's way of looking at it. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I never thought that. <laughs> so thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Uh, appreciate your friendship. Yeah, can't wait to talk again. Likewise. Looking forward to the next time. <laughs>